Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Summit Church. My name is Eli, and I'm really grateful to be with you all this morning. I'm so grateful for all of us who have chosen to be here, whether we're here in the room or here online. I know that, um, you know, we could choose to be anywhere, and we've chosen to be here, and I'm really grateful for every one of us that has chosen to do so. And my hope and expectation is that as we, you know, show up, as we bring ourselves in today, that we'll get to encounter God's goodness, that, you know, as we come in with openness, and I know we're coming in from all kinds of different places. Some of us are having a really awesome time, and some of us are struggling to get here, um, maybe this like worship practice is central to our spirituality and our faith, and maybe we're just trying something new or checking it out. And, you know, as we gather, as we're in all kinds of different places and different situations, um, you know, my hope and belief is that God will continue to meet us right exactly where we are. And so I hope that, uh, that during our time as we sing together, as we pray together, as we reflect on Scripture and continue to think about what it looks like to, um, to sort of reconstruct a faith on this foundation of the life of Jesus, um, that we will experience God meeting us right exactly where we are and we'll experience the invitation to take a step, um, whatever that looks like for us today. And so uh, so as we engage in our time of worship, we're going to start by singing a couple songs. So those of us who are able, um, I'm going to invite us to stand together and we're going to join in singing. worship our King. Come let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in the freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, I sing your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. Faithful in every storm, you'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things, and I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. God, you do great things. done great things Hallelujah God above it all Hallelujah God unshakable Hallelujah you have done great things you've done great things Oh hero of heaven you conquered the grave 
You free every captive and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We fancy your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, I sing you, your name lifted high, oh God. You have done great things. You have done great things. As we worship, as we gather, particularly as I think we're just kind of coming in and settling into the space and sort of orienting ourselves toward being present, I know for me, um, there are a lot of things that are distracting in life, a lot of things that can kind of pull my attention um, away from how I want to be oriented and just taking a second to say, oh yeah, um, I'm coming in to orient toward worshiping a God who does great things. Um, it's not It's not really about me. This is the God who claims me and loves me. And this is a God who is working about redemption and restoration. And so I can, I can take a second to get out of my own head, get out of my own way, and reorient to this good God. And know that, yeah, like we were talking about last week, that, you know, our identity as, as people who are claimed and loved by God is something that's a foundation from which we live. It's not like our activity or what we do is is the core thing. It's this who God is, what God has done, what God says, and God says to each one of us, I love you. You are worthy. Um, you know, come on in. You're welcome here. You're wanted here. Um, and I think that's just such an important thing for me to orient myself toward. And so as, uh, as we continue to think about this faith journey, um, we remember that this foundation of all that we claim is this work and goodness of God. So we're going to sing a song kind of about, about that. sang the morning sky, Lord, you knew me. You had seen my truant heart, still you reached into my dark. Now the blood of sacred scars stirs my soul to see. Oh, my soul, oh, my soul, Boast in the Lord, He has lifted you out of the grave. My soul will boast in the Lord. By His death, we have died. By His life, we've been lifted on high. My soul will boast in the Lord. In my heart and in my home When tomorrow stands unknown When my soul is winter and stone Lord, remind me You are there when seasons change You are mending all you've made This my prayer, this my pain Purify me. Oh, my soul, oh, my soul, boast in the Lord. He has lifted you out of the grave. My soul, boast in the Lord. By his 
dead, we have died by his life, we've been lifted on high, my soul will boast in the Lord, my soul will boast in the Lord. My silver end is near, may my restless heart be still, in my fading strength and years, Lord be near me, as my body enters rest, oh my soul you resurrect, you have triumphed over death, glory is Oh, my soul, oh, my soul, boast in the Lord. He has lifted you out of the grave. My soul will boast in the Lord. By his death, we have died. By his life, we've been lifted on high. My soul will boast in the Lord. By his death, we have died. By his life, we've been lifted on high. My soul will boast in the Lord. My soul will boast in the Lord. My Father, as we go about our busy day today, I ask that you would give us a sense of peace and calm. Help us not to get stressed out, worried or frantic about all the problems we see around us. Instead, please give us a sense of peace and calm that comes from you, knowing that you are in control. You have it all figured out, and our best is enough because we can always trust you to take care of the issues and situations we can. Please help us keep our eyes on you today, not on the negativity of the world around us. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, good morning. It's great to be with you today, and uh, we're just, I don't know, just every time we gather for worship and I hear your voices uh, lift up, I'm just encouraged, and so I'm really glad you're here. And if it's your first time with us, we have a little QR codes in the back of chairs. We invite you to zap that with your phone and tell us a bit about yourself, and then we'll make a donation in your name to our food ministry. It's our way of connecting uh, right away with you and, and know that we're serving uh, God together in that way. Uh, we'd also uh, love it if you, whether you've been here, it's your first time or many times, we, we pray that uh, just the Holy Spirit would touch your heart and fill you and encourage you and, and that you might maybe turn to the people around you and give them a word of encouragement, kind of the presence of the church for the people sitting around you. So if you're willing, would you do that uh, real quickly, whatever way you're comfortable, either a handshake, a hug, a fist bump, whatever, just a wave. Do that right now if you wouldn't mind. If you're online, uh, check in with us too. We'd love to have you check in with us and let us know that you're with us online as well. Will you be an angel for a helpless church staff member? Every day, innocent staff are tired, experience burnout, and go on vacation, and they're crying out for help. Please, 
Visit the website on your screen with a monthly volunteering gift now. For just a few hours per month, you'll help rescue staff from their responsibilities and provide wholesome time off with their families, maternity leave, skiing breaks, and love. Call the front office or join online in the next 30 minutes and you'll receive our undying gratitude and a photo of a staff person in a professional setting right now. One who's been given a second chance, thanks to you. Your sign up says, I'm here to help. Please visit now. Now, let's prepare our hearts for the message. Deconstruction has recently become a hot topic in the Christian faith. But Jesus himself did this very thing while on earth. He teaches us to reconstruct our faith by rooting ourselves in following him. He invites us to live out who we are and not what we say. This Lent, let's seek out a fresh vision from Christ that can deeply transform our lives. We'll experience God's love in such a way that we can confidently love God, love others, love ourselves, and share the good news. Build your faith on solid ground with us and enable your interior and exterior worlds to become like the kingdom of God. So all through middle school, they had the same conversation at our house. When my daughter was in middle school, she'd come home and she'd say, Dad, I really need a phone. Everybody has a phone. If I don't have a phone, I'm going to die. And so finally one day I said to her, Honey, uh, first of all, our philosophy was you'll get a phone when we need you to have a phone. That was kind of our philosophy and uh, since we're paying for it. Uh, but I also said, um, uh, I didn't get a phone till I was 30 years old. <laughs> and she said to me, Dad, your parents were so mean. <laughs> I can't believe Grandma didn't get you a phone till you were 30. And I said, well, honey, I, I didn't get a phone until I was 30 because they didn't have them, all right? And, and the phone I had was this little thing that you pushed the buttons on it and went, ee, 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 you know, and you couldn't text her. You couldn't text people? You mean you had to talk on the phone to people, Dad? I'm like, yeah, that's the way phones used to work. That's how they kind of started. And, and, and here's what I recognize, and you probably do too. A lot has changed just in the last 50 years. In the last 50 years, we've seen more change than the 500 years before that. And we continue to see change after change after change. And in, and in many ways, it causes us to, to reconsider our faith and to reconsider all the things that we've learned and we've grown up learning and what many people are doing in today's world and what you may have read about is this idea of recon, uh, deconstruction. People are deconstructing their faith. And in particular, people who've been followers of Jesus or have been Christians because they have a faith that was kind of handed to them have been leaving the faith in, in droves. I mean, we see church attendance plummeting. We see people who say they are people who are Christian or following Jesus. We see that declining year after year. And in many ways, it's because they're deconstructing all these things because of all the changes happening in the world. So today, what we're going to do is continue in a sermon series where we're asking ourselves, what does it mean to, to, to deconstruct this faith? Because deconstruction without reconstruction is a tragedy. I mean, because the idea is we all need something, especially in today's world where things are changing. What do we have to stand on that literally can be stable in the middle of a world that feels so unstable at times? And I want to suggest to you that as we look specifically at Jesus and what it means to follow Jesus and what it means to learn and to live in him, that it actually can give us this faith that is solid and stable. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned last week, we talked about the different reasons why people are deconstructing last week, and you can go back and kind of check that out if you're wondering kind of some of the foundation of this. But what's really fascinating, I find, is that a lot of the reasons people are deconstructing today are the very same reasons that Jesus himself deconstructed the faith of his childhood. He deconstructed his faith that was handed to him and reconstructed something radically different that people could grab a hold on and that would carry us some 2,000 years into today. I mean, he, there, there was struggle with the institutions of his day in the first century, just like there is today. There were a diverse, the world was becoming more diverse as the Greco-Roman world began to expand and people began to see all, all kinds of different people and all kinds of different colors of people, much more so than they ever had before. A lot of those things were the same then as they are now. And, and that's why a lot of people are kind of 
pulling apart their faith and Jesus did the same thing. And in many ways, he encouraged his followers to do that. And we're going to learn about that today, especially one of his main followers, Simon Peter, who was kind of the, the, you know, the main disciple, if you were going to see him deconstruct his faith today and what we look at. One of the resources we've been using for this series is called Emotionally Healthy Discipleship. It was written by Pete Scazzaro. He's written a whole series of books on emotionally healthy spirituality. And the idea is this, that to really grow, we have to have emotional health as well as spiritual health. And, and, and it, the idea of following Jesus, that's what discipleship means, happens because we construct a faith. And, and, and by the way, Pete himself deconstructed his entire faith. He was a pastor of a large church, a multi Seaside Church in New York, and, he, and his wife said, I don't want to be married to you anymore. I don't like the church anymore. I don't like, and, and they had to deconstruct and reconstruct their faith. And so we have those books if you're interested, because some of the stuff we're doing is based on that as well as uh, daily devotional that he has to go with it. But the first thing we talked about last week was that if we want to reconstruct a faith that's on solid ground, one of the things Jesus does is he literally puts being before doing. We're human beings, not human doings. And that's hard for us because many of us were raised to do things and, and many of us have to-do lists. And we talked last week about how a lot of us put together a to-do list, but we never pray before we do it. We just do stuff. And we don't really ask, is this really what God wants me to do? And that's what we're going to once again look at today in this story. We're going to look at Matthew 16, maybe one of the most important chapters in your entire Bible if you're going to follow Jesus, because it's a whole section where things shift from people just following Jesus to him saying, here's what it actually begins to look like. Once you've been with me and you're being with me, here's what it looks like as we begin to shift. I always like to take you to these places, by the way, where these stories happen. And today, the story makes much much, much more sense if you know where it happens. So I'm going to be taking a trip to the Holy Land, this region, in 2024, in February, actually about a year from now, February 20th. If you want to go, if you ever wanted to go, you can join us. But I want to give you, I tried to give you a little Bible history, so let's do a little bit of kind of just, let me just ask you a couple things, see if you've kind of been paying attention. What's that little area I just circled, the body of water? Anybody know? See, that's the Sea of Galilee, all right? The Jordan River comes down the middle. What's the area on the bottom? It's the lowest part lowest body water. It's the Dead Sea. On the left over there, that's the Mediterranean Sea. There's a little place, a circle on the right. Anybody know what that is? You don't need to because there's nothing there. I'm just kind of testing you a little bit to see. But we're going to go up north to Caesarea Philippi. It's about a day and a half journey, 25 miles. And from there, you can experience and be at the base of what's called Mount Hermon. At Mount Hermon looks like this from the Sea of Galilee. It's actually one of the largest mountains in the region. It's got snow on it almost all year long and we drove up right at the base of it. And when you drive at the base of it, one of the places you get to see and know is that they actually here in this region have a ski area. They have a gondola, they have lifts. Uh, the backside of the mountain is a place where people come from all over the region to ski. And they just had a snowstorm, and this was somebody snapped a photo. I pulled this off the web. Uh, you can just see this whole region from the top of that, and it's just, it's beautiful. But you have to understand it because where are you going to go to Caesarea Philippi? It's actually not in the region of Israel when Jesus goes there. He literally is leaving the nation of Israel, going to what is Syria, and we call it Syria modern day, and he goes there with his disciples to have this conversation. And all the water that comes off of Mount Hermon on this side of the mountain comes down through the rocks and up into Caesarea Philippi, which is literally the headwaters of the Jordan River, which flows into that Sea of Galilee and then out of the Sea of Galilee again. And the reason why this is important is because some of the things Jesus is going to say in this story, you, you, it will just, it just, the point is driven home much more deeply when you're sitting there. Uh, we got to go there. One of the first times I got to go, there was with a group here from this church last time I was there. Next time we go, we're going to go there again because it's such a beautiful spot. Uh, this is what it looks like when you get to Caesarea Philippi. It's these headwaters once again that literally come up and bubble up out of the ground and begin the Jordan River. That cave up off, that's where the headwaters used to be, but an earthquake happened. It filled in some of that space. But when you go to this region, you go up above the headwaters and there are the remains of 14 different Greco-Roman temples as well well as in the walls, niches where they used to put the Greco-Roman gods and come to worship them. This would have been what, when Jesus came here with the disciples, and that's the grotto where it used to be that the waters bubble up out of there and literally came into, and they went into a big hole in the ground, and that's how the headwaters started, was water coming out of the rocks, going into a hole in the ground. Once again, earthquake kind of filled that in, but these niches and these ruins, this is probably where Jesus was standing when he teaches this teaching in Matthew 16. Now, it begs the question, 
Why does he do this? Why does he travel out of the country a day and a half away from where his home base is in Capernaum and the Sea of Galilee to have this conversation? Well, I think we're going to discover that as we begin to read it because here's what we read. Jesus comes to this region of Caesarea Philippi and he asks his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, Some say John the Baptist. So John the Baptist, which was the cousin of Jesus, had died uh, probably months before this. And some people were saying, well, he was John the Baptist, come back to life. Uh, Some people say Elijah. The last book in your Hebrew Bible in the Old Testament is the book of Malachi. And it says that the prophet Elijah will come back before the Messiah shows up again. So some people say you're Elijah, come back to life. Uh, Some people say Jeremiah, another prophet who predicted that he would come back again before the Messiah. Or one of the other prophets. And so he's asking this very concrete question, and he's saying, what are people saying about me, basically? And here's what's interesting. Jesus has been walking around, teaching, talking, healing for a year and a half, and people still aren't quite sure who he is. You know, if you or anyone you know has ever wrestled with who is this Jesus character, you're not alone. The people walking with him didn't fully understand it or get him sometimes. And then he asked them this question, which is meant to be one that reverberates 2,000 years later, even to us today. Because here's the question I think Jesus is going to ask us, each of us. Who do you say that I am? Jesus asks his disciples this question. Now, there's, here's how I envision this scenario playing out. He's at this spot. It's a beautiful spot. It, it's, today it's called uh, Benius, which is short for Penius. Uh, the god of Pan was worshipped in that grotto because it's the, he's the god of creation. And they're sitting there in this beautiful spot. And he says, well, who do you say that I am? And we're meant to ask that question ourselves. And, and, and when he asked the question, have you ever been in class and, and the teacher asks a question and you're not sure if it's a rhetorical question or if you're supposed to raise your hand and answer it? You ever have that happen? I think that's what happens in this story. They're all sitting around going, does he want us to answer? Is it a trick question? Are we spo- what are we supposed to say? And, and how are we supposed to say it? And, and, then, and then finally, Simon Peter speaks up and says, well, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Um, would you just say this phrase with me? Uh, just say it out loud. Just I want you to say it out loud and kind of hear it ring in your head for a minute. Say, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And all the other disciples are probably like, oh, that's what I was thinking. I didn't know he wanted us to say it out loud. And, and here's what's interesting. This is the first statement of faith in the early church. You are the Messiah. Now, within the next couple of hundred years after his death and resurrection, we would talk about him as the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus as Lord and Savior. Jesus as our friend. Jesus, we would have all these other names, but this is how it kind of begins with this name. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And, and the word Messiah is really important here. It comes from a Hebrew word, Mashiach, and the Latin is Christos. That's the Latin, you know, we often say Jesus Christ. Christ is not Jesus' last name. Christos is literally his title because it means anointed one. And here's what they were saying when they said, you're the Messiah. This, because every single king in the Hebrew tradition had been a Mashiach. They had been anointed. They literally put oil on their heads and they pray over them. Uh, by the way, when Queen Elizabeth and, and then, you know, Prince Charles who will become king, when they're brought into Today, even kings are and queens are anointed, and they anoint them on their head and on their heart and on their hands. And the idea is that they are set apart by God. Their head, their heart, their hands are God's now, and they're going to do this great thing for God. And here's what they all thought. They thought Jesus as the son of the living God of Mashiach was going to come like all the other messiahs have been predicted, and he was going to come and he was going to wipe out the Romans. This is a great place to start the movement, Jesus. We're out Outside the country, we're in Syria, and you are the Messiah. We're going to raise up an army, and we're going to go in back into Israel from the north all the way down to Jerusalem, and we're going to wipe out those Romans, and we're going to conquer, and this is going to be awesome, Jesus. And when they call him this title, the son of the living God, here's the other thing you have to know. They're sitting literally probably in one of the temples to Caesar Augustus. All those temples were dedicated to Caesar the different Caesars, if you will. And when you look at the coins of the first century, it would say Caesar on one side. And on the other side, it would say, see where it says on the left-hand side, D-I-V-I-F? 
Divi F. Do you know what that means? Divi is divine. F is Philios, which means son. He was the, Caesar was called the son of God. And when Peter says, you're the son of the living God, he's saying, you're the king of kings. You're the Lord of lords. That's what they used to call the Caesar, by the way. Uh, but now we know that you are the king of kings, the Lord of lords, and you're not just the son of a dead God. Caesar's dead now. Right now, the ruler of this region is Philippi. It's what's called Caesarea Philippi. So we know you're not just the son of a, a dead God. You're the son of the living God. And this is awesome. We're going to ride triumphantly in, and we're going to take over, and we're going to wipe. This is going to be great, Jesus. This is going to be awesome. And Jesus even affirms it. Jesus says, you're blessed, Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed. In other words, God is, one, once again, being with God then reveals who Jesus is for you. That, that's the whole idea. And by the way, this question is meant to be one we all wrestle with. And, and then he says, you did not learn this from any human being. You learned it from being with me, in other words. And the Holy Spirit reveals it to you. Now I say to you that you're Peter. So this is where he gets his name, Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And all the powers of hell will not conquer it. All right, this is really important. This is where the whole story begins to shift. And by the way, all of Matthew's gospel begins to shift from this story moving forward. Because here's what happens from this story. Jesus is saying, eventually, I'm gonna hand things over to you, Peter. You're gonna be in charge, to which here's what Peter's thinking. This is my time. This is awesome. I, get le I got the answer right. I'm a teacher's pet, you know? Um, this is awesome. This is great. I'm gonna be the one to help lead the charge we're gonna go into. And, 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 and not only that, but now here's once again what you have to understand the place this is happening. All right, so that spot that we showed you there was a little a cavern or a grotto it's called pan's grotto now but it used to be before an earthquake came there was a hole literally where that grotto was the water came out of literally the rocks went down into the hole and then it would gurgle up down below and that's where the headwaters would start and those who worshiped satan or who were pagan worshipers would come and they would sacrifice children and women in this hole because it would go down to the god of hades and then they hoped that would restore their soul, if you will. So they would sacrifice people in that hole. And so he says, look, this rock upon you, I'll build my church and all the powers of hell. I mean, people think this is literally where the entrance to hell is. All the powers of hell will not overcome it. And I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Every city, by the way, had a gate with a lock and keys and the person of honor had the keys and they could open up and let people in and out, whoever they wanted to. Uh, whatever you Forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. All right, here's a really important part of this for us, because you and I are now the church. Peter is the one upon whom the church will be built, but you, and here's the important thing, it's not Peter's church. It's not your church. It's not my church. It's God's church. People say to me sometimes, uh, Pastor Jeff, your church is, and I'm like, oh, let's stop there for a minute. It's not mine. You don't come here to worship Jeff. Uh, and, and by the way, our temptation is to make it about us, and I want to be in charge. That's what Peter's going to try to do, but this is Jesus' church. This is God's church. Uh, Peter would later write, you know, after the death and resurrection, when Peter is forming the church, he would write several letters. And in one of them, in 1 Peter 2, he'd say, you are coming to Christ, you who are the people, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. There's this idea of, of a rock, of something to build something solid on. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are the living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priests, though through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. When we did a big remodel here, we had those of you who gave to this to make sure we could have, you know, that atrium that you walk in, our infant center, a lot of the places that you all are enjoying now was built in about 2004. This whole building was built in 1970, but we did a huge remodel. And what we did was we had each of you come in uh, during worship and we gave you stones and you painted your name on it or drew your name on it. And we have a stone garden. We have a, the living stones are right out in front of it. They're covered by snow right now, but they're right out in front of the office area. And those are there to remind us that we are the living stones. And so here's the idea that when... When, when, when God wants to deal with something happening in the world that's evil or wrong or, you know, just horrible thing, he doesn't typically send angels from heaven. He doesn't typically do some miraculous thing where he suspends the laws of nature. He sends the church. 
You and I, because not even the gates of hell, not even the gates of hell will overcome it. It's called the ecclesia, the gathering. And by the way, that was just a generic term, church, a gathering of like-minded people that came to do the work of the one who founded it. And the one who founded it was Jesus. So here's the question we're meant to ask that, by the way, comes out of first being with Jesus. Then we ask this question, what does Jesus need us to do as his church? What does he want us to do? I want to suggest to you that one of the reasons many of us struggle with purpose and meaning is we're trying to figure it all out on our own instead of being with God, being with Jesus first and then saying, what do you want me to do? Because then all the powers of hell will not conquer it. All the powers of hell. And once again, here's that grotto that used to be where people were sacrificed and Jesus says, and this is so important to know what's happening in this place, in this space, when Jesus comes here to do this teaching. He says, this may seem like the entrance to hell, but let me just tell you, the powers of hell, not even this place, nothing that you see here will keep us from doing what it is God wants to do in the world because we are the church. But the question is, are we doing what God wants us to do or we want to do? I want to suggest to you one of the reasons many people are deconstructing their faith today is because we're doing what we want to do. Not necessarily what God wants us to do. We think, you know, we, we attach God's names to things all the time that I think God wants his name attached to. We do it all the time. And the reason we do that is because we just do instead of be first. And then we say, Jesus, what do you, we get up in the morning, we say, God, what do you want me to do? It's interesting. Um, Jesus then gives what we call the mysterious Messiah um, statement, all right? Then Jesus sternly warned his disciples, don't tell anyone he was Messiah. Now, this is weird, isn't it? Like, what, what, what do you mean? Don't tell people. Jesus, we want people to know you're the kingdom Messiah. We need to raise up an army. And Jesus says, that's not how it's going to work. See, everything's going to flip in the next sentence Jesus is going to say. But here's the other reason he says it this way. And I say this, this is how I put it to you all the time. I can't give you faith. You can't have my faith. It has to be yours. Here's the thing. You have to wrestle with this question when Jesus says, who am I? Who do you say that I am? You have to wrestle with that question. And what he want, he doesn't want the disciples to go out and tell everybody this is what you need to do and how you need to do it. He wants them to have a relationship with him, to be with him, and then out of that, they can figure out their doing. And when they go to figure that out, by the way, here's where he's gonna give us a guide to what that looks like, by the way, because from then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem. So I'm gonna leave this spot, we're gonna head down to Galilee, and then we're gonna go to Jerusalem, and that I would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law, the, the religious folks are the ones that are gonna put it, they're not gonna get it, they're not gonna get who he is, and he would be killed. But on the third day, he'd be raised from the dead. And now, this is kind of a whole killjoy moment, right, for Peter. He's like, yes, I'm going to be the leader. And then it's like, what? That's not, no way, that, that can't happen, Jesus. Peter takes him aside, and he begins to reprimand him for saying such things. He says, heaven forbid, Lord, this will never happen to you. This isn't the plan that I have in my head for you or for this movement. And Jesus says, sorry, if you really want to be with me, and know who I am. I'm going to tell you, you're going to see what it looks like. And, and it's not this glorious thing up front that you think it's going to be. You know, it's interesting when Jesus says this statement and then we later see that he's put to death by the religious leaders. Sometimes you have atheist friends who will say things like this. Um, you know, these horrible evil has been done in the name of religion. You know what your answer is? You're right. And by the way, horrible evil has been done in the name of anything with an ism, even atheism. Atheists have done some horrible, horrible things. Uh, you know why? Because we're all people. That's one of the reasons why Jesus came and why he didn't just raise up an army to slaughter everybody, but he instead transformed the whole Roman world in a very different way. Because Jesus then turns to Peter. He says, get away from me, Satan. You're a dangerous trap to me. You're seeing things merely from a human point of view and not God's point of view. Last week, we talked about the story of Jesus going in the wilderness and he's tempted there by Satan. This is, once again, you're meant to remember back to that story. It happens in Matthew's gospel, right? And, and he's saying this same thing, Peter, that he said, it's like this, and, and here's what we learn, that sometimes it's the people closest to us that every now and then will say things like, yeah, that's not really right. 
That's not really the direction. And unless we're being with Jesus, really spending time in prayer with Jesus, saying, Jesus, what do you want me to do? Unless we're listening to that voice, we can get distracted. And here's what he's saying. You're trying to distract me and get me to do what you want me to do. But God has a different plan. Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you want to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. And I can tell you at this point, remember, Jesus has not been crucified and he hasn't been resurrected. So you know what the cross means? It means torture, pain, hurt, It means the most awful way of death possible. And so I can guarantee you, they're all sitting there going, what? What? That that can't be right, Jesus. Let's, hey, can we give you a different answer to start telling everybody? Because that's not the right one. But Jesus says, no, no, this is what it means. And it's going to change everything. You see, there are three things Jesus is going to talk about from here on out. He's going to talk about self-denial, which that's not very much fun, right? I mean, who wants to deny ourselves? I, we, we live in a world where we want to have pleasure. We, wanna, we want everything. We want our kids, everything to be perfect for our kids. One of the reasons many people are deconstructing their faith is because they've grown up in a world where everything's been kind of easy. And they're like, is this all there is? Is this it? I mean, part of what develops our character and who we are makes like meaningful is having to work through hard stuff, developing some resiliency. That only happens when you're willing to deny yourself sometimes and not always give ourselves what we want. But we kind of live in a culture that says, take whatever you want, get what, have it all be good. And he's also going to talk about sacrifice, not another thing we like to talk about. Like, he's going to talk about, here's how you want to find meaning and purpose. You want to find, uh, you want to find what it means to really follow me. And then he says, and that means following me, meaning these things all go together. If you really want to follow me, you have to learn about self-denial, about sacrifice, about what it means to do these things. Because he says this, if you hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you'll save it. I was reading this week another article about how we continue to see just almost exponential growth in people wrestling with things like uh, suicide, depression, anxiety, and there's lots of different reasons. And sometimes we need a good counselor. Sometimes we need, uh, you know, medicine because our body chemistry gets out of whack. But, but often what they're discovering is many people don't have a sense of purpose. And a lot of times it's because we're doing what we think we want to do for me. I want this. I this. I that. And Jesus says it's not where you find meaning and purpose. You, you know, because if you hang on to your life, you try to grab onto it. I mean, if you really want a faith built on a rock, if you want to reconstruct a faith, Jesus says, that will carry you through, uh, you need to reconstruct a faith on one that recognizing that giving away is what brings life. And you know this is true. Think about the moments that have brought you the most joy. Oftentimes, it's because you're doing something for someone else and it makes your heart and your soul begin to smile and go, oh yeah, wow. And, and, and here is kind of our memory verse for the week. Would you just say this together with me out loud? Because this, this is the whole point Jesus is trying to make. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? Okay. This is where you need to know where this story happens. It happens in front of a grotto that is a place at that point, there hadn't been the earthquake yet, there was a hole and all the water's running into the hole and people would sacrifice children and women into the hole in order for their soul to be restored. And Jesus is saying, that's not how it works. That's not, here's how it works. It works when you're willing to give yourself away. This last week, um, I was uh, interacting with one of my former uh, youth that was in one of the churches I served uh, years ago, and, and, and I had seen on her Facebook stuff that there was some medical things she was going through, and what I didn't know, I, I, she, she reached out to me because she said, I'm back in a church again for the first time in, you know, really since I was in youth group. And, and this is a young woman whose mom was on our staff and who was a, one of the leaders in our group but had kind of left and deconstructed her faith and, and now she was back and, and she began to tell me her story. She said, I, I, uh, my pancreas failed because it's some genetics and I, and I got an organ transplant. And she began to talk about how important organ transplant had been to her and, and how grateful she was. There was a young person who had checked that box on their driver's license and she received that gift and she met their family and heard about sacrifice and what that was and how family had prayed that whoever got this, it would be a gift and the sacrifice of their son. And can I, first of all, just a little sidebar, check the box. Ultimate sacrifice is, well, it's not really a sacrifice. You don't need the organs when you're gone, okay? 
But, but what an amazing, and, and I was thinking about this story about sacrifice, self-denial, and she said, and I realized if I want to find purpose and meaning because now I have a new lease, I, I need to be back in the living stones and figure that out. I was thinking about some of you who give up vacation, your money, your finances to go to, we have a group we're going to bless to go to Kenya. Um, it's an all-women group that we're sending for the first time. It's really, I'm really excited to see what happens as they go and they work with the widows and the women in the place called Obaga. But many of them are giving up, they're giving up a lot just to go. We have a staff person going, giving up weeks of vacation to go. All right, uh, why do you do that? Because you realize that's where you find meaning and purpose. Some of you, you know, we had that cute little thing that Stacy made about uh, volunteering. You know, you give up your time, your, your talent, you give up those things and then that's how you find your soul. I was reading this last week about this group, the Traveling Rescue Rigs, uh, also called uh, the Heroes. Uh, it started in 2017. Uh, uh, there was a gentleman um, that realized in the middle of the hurricane remnant that had happened in uh, Houston that his rig could drive through some of these places and they literally saved thousands of people and he called his buddies and now they literally show up at any natural disaster all over. And this last week, they were in places where there were ice storms and snowstorms, and they show up and I was reading about their story and here's what I found interesting. <laughs> they can't get insurance anymore for their trucks. Well, they don't care. That's sacrifice. And they're, by, school, by the way, they're veterans that are a part of this, uh, people that have served our nation. They're, they're EMTs and police and firefighters and others. And before they go anywhere, they pray together and say, God, take us where you need us to go. We, uh, I wouldn't call it celebrate, but we remember this last week, one year since Russia went into Ukraine, and, uh, you know, I have a strong connection there because that's where our kids are from. I've been there uh, several times. And, and, and what you may not know is there are still people, followers of Jesus, who are in Ukraine helping people survive. And I was reading this last week or seeing this last week about a group of them that are young people. Uh, YWAM is called Youth with a Mission. And they're typically sent in to start churches and do things, but many of them were there when this war started and they're still there. We have several of our youth, by the way, that are training to go serve with YWAM in different parts of the world. But I wanted you to see their story a bit because I thought this is what it means to self-deny, to sacrifice, and to to follow Jesus. Let's take a listen. Wow. Justine and Mary sprung sprung into into action. action. Turning, turning the sprawling, the sprawling YWAM, YWAM campus, campus into, into a humanitarian, humanitarian aid, aid hub. hub. And, and they're, they're just dropping, dropping all, of all of these things, things here. here. So, so our, our job, job is to um, sort, all sort all these things, things out. So it, so it looks chaotic. chaotic. Natalia, Natalia Torbina and her two sons, sons work, work in the in kitchen, kitchen making, making meals, meals for the for folks, folks in the neighborhood. It depends on the day. Sometimes there are days when we cook for a thousand people, sometimes 500 or 600. The only thought that gave me peace was to go back to the parade. So that's, so that's why I'm here. Katarina, also, also a YWAM missionary, missionary here, here, is from, from Finland. Finland. I'm, not I'm not saying, saying that, that God was the one who forced, forced me to go to, to the war zone, zone or that, or that it, was it was somehow like, like I, I, can, can, I didn't have a choice. I had a choice. That was my choice. My choice was to come here and God opened the door. She evacuated just before war started, but returned days later. Wait, we're walking up across flights of stairs. Yeah. Now, now Katarina, Katarina hits, hits the streets of Kiev, Kiev delivering food, food and other, and other aid, aid supplies, supplies to those, to those unable, unable to leave their apartments. Thank you for how much Each visit ended, ended with, with time, time of prayer. 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 That's okay, That's okay. I don't know you can't either. either. While, While Katarina, Katarina makes, makes her daily, daily deliveries, David, David Selsky, who, who normally, normally handles maintenance on the YYM campus, campus, is, is making, making dangerous missions to evacuate people, people trapped behind, behind Russian, Russian lines. lines. Cause, cause every, every time, time when I go to these areas, areas I, prepare I prepare myself that I might not get, get out, out of there. I pray, I pray every, every time. time. I'm not, I'm not counting, counting, but I've, I've evacuated, evacuated more than 100, 100 people. people. I just, I just work, work and work, work as, as long as, long as, as I can. can. And, and as, as long, long as God, God allows, allows me to help. help. For Jeffrey, Marie, Marie, and others, and others at YWAM, YYM ministering, ministering in Ukraine's, in Ukraine's war, zone war zone is ultimately about fulfilling, about fulfilling a, commitment a commitment to serve. To serve. I think, I think it's, it's not, not so much about, about handing out food packages, packages now, now or like, like cooking meals or like, or like distributing, distributing some, some, some humanitarian, humanitarian aid. That, that is not, not the main thing that God has been preparing for because, because everybody, everybody can, can do that. that. But, the but the hard thing, thing to do is to do it while you hear challenging bombs. bombs. 
and why, and why you see continuously, continuously on the news how in your city, city not, not far, far away from, from you, you um, a, a building, building is, burning, is burning and people, and people are, dying. are dying. But I just, but I just do it because, because of love for the, for the country, country and, and because, because of commitment, commitment to saying I'm not stepping, stepping away. away. And then, and if, then I if I feed two people, people or, or if I help to feed thousand people a day, maybe in my heart it doesn't make a difference because my commitment to God is just the same. Every now and then, <clears throat> people will say, oh, I can't believe this younger generation, da, 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 da. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I see stories like this all the time. And they've deconstructed their faith. Many of them have kind of left church. But they haven't left Jesus. And part of the reason is because the church has forgotten what it means to be the church. It means we love God. We love others. We self-deny. We sacrifice. We don't demand our own way. We give ourselves away. And as we do that, we reconstruct a faith built on something solid. That's what we all want so that we can restore our soul. That's what God longs to do. And by the way, Jesus came and did all that work for us. All we have to do is say yes. Say yes, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. We receive that gift and then we listen and we pray. And every morning we get up and say, God, what do you want me to do today? Before I make my list, where do you want me to go? Doing that is how you reconstruct your faith. Would you bow your heads and let's pray together. Uh, some of us who are sitting here, maybe we've never really wrestled with this question Jesus puts before us where he says, who do you say that I am? And so just pause for a minute in the silence and uh, maybe answer that question in your heart right now. It, and it might be different than it was years ago. Maybe it'll be different in the future, but at least for right now, when Jesus asks you, who do you say that I am? What's your answer? Is it you're the Messiah, the son of the living God, a savior, friend? Maybe just take a minute in the quiet and lift that up to God. And then uh, maybe we've never thought about the fact that following Jesus means self-denial and sacrifice. We kind of get caught up in our world that says we should have everything and, and we forget what it means to choose to do the loving thing, even for those that we disagree with, even those that we might consider our enemies. Jesus said we love them too because that's what changes the world. That's what helps the world become more like my kingdom. So maybe think about some places in your life where God might be calling you to sacrifice or self-deny or do something a bit different so that you might discover your soul. Let me just take a minute and invite God to speak to you around that. And then finally, I'm going to invite you to think about um, the people of Turkey, Syria, Ukraine, maybe some other places come to your heart as we think about um, the natural disasters we experience or we see, or, or maybe somebody you know just going through personal trauma, or uh, maybe somebody who needs a transplant. I, I'm not sure what might come to your heart, but maybe uh, just bring that to God in the silence. God, we thank you for coming and meeting us here, for giving us the opportunity, for encouraging us to ask questions. You asked us questions so we might wrestle with them. So God, we thank you for asking, who are you? And help us as we wrestle that to come to understand you as the Messiah, the son of the living God. And, and may that, may that, may that de- help us develop a relationship with you that might go deep and we might hold on to that. And then out of that, we might go forward and be the people you long for us to be. Uh, God, you have hopes, dreams for all of us, desires for your people. This place is your living stones. Help us to live that out as your church, God. Thank you for this story and for where it happened and for reminding us in a very tangible and powerful way that we can be your presence in the world as we follow you. God, we ask and we pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus, and the people of God said, amen. I invite you to come and respond by just lifting your voices to God. If you're willing, would you just sing and let's sing about what this faith might mean to us.
Daily, daily I surrender Grace for today is all that I need Surprised by your mercy, it's new every morning Awaken my soul to sin Awaken my soul to sing I will trust Where you lead I will trust When I can't see Morning by morning Red is your faithfulness To me Breath by breath Overtaken by one One step at a time when I'm overwhelmed Strength for today, bright hope for tomorrow Awaken my soul to sing Awaken my soul to sing And I will trust when I can't see Morning by morning Red is your faithfulness To me And I will trust With all my heart You are good You always are Morning by morning Red is your faithfulness journey of you know, considering what it is to follow um, to follow God to follow Jesus uh, you know we can place our trust in this God who goes before us and is with us in all things and one of the things that I just need to be reminded of is that you know every every breath is a gift um, and every breath is a gift of life uh, but as as we understand it in our journey of faith it's it's more than just life. That's an amazing gift in and of itself. But it's also this, um, each breath is an opportunity for fresh life, for new life, for continuing to be raised up and empowered to follow this path of, of restoration and redemption, to, 
to continue to participate in this restorative work that God has. And so we're going to sing one more song where we're remembering that this work of God, this restorative God is someone who invites us into this story, invites us into this journey where we can say, you know, we have these moments and every breath we receive is a time where we can say, you know what? my life is beginning anew again. So we're going to sing a song uh, that kind of keeps us in that vein. Alone in my sorrow, dead in my sin, lost without hope, no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested my life began Ash was redeemed only beauty remains My orphan heart was given a name my morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested, my life began Oh, your grace so free Washes over me You have made me new now From my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom, he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested, my life began. For your grace, so free, washes over. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus rose with our freedom in hell. That's when the was rested, my life began. Oh, the grace so free washes Yeah. 
Yeah, would y'all pray with me? Lord God, we are so grateful that you are a loving and generous God who gives the gift of life, who gives the gift of new life and full life. Um, may we experience that um, evermore. May we continue to experience more and more of your goodness. Um, as you pour that into us, may we be shaped into the likeness of Christ and empowered and sent to participate in your restorative work in the world. Fill us up with your love and send us to be your loving presence to one another. We ask all of this by the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, one of the ways that we live out this idea that we talked about today following Jesus is giving. And many of you have been so faithful giving online. You can give a text, app. We have boxes as you leave. And uh, today we're going to be uh, praying over as they leave a team that's going to Kenya. And, and you're giving helps support that as well as we still have relief efforts happening in Turkey and Syria where we have some missionaries we support in Ukraine and all those things happen uh, because of your willing to sacrifice so thank you for doing that. Um, if you need prayer we have folks who can pray with you that are down here at the front after the service they'd be happy to spend some time with you. Uh, meditation moments are on our website it's our way of encouraging you to be, be deeper and, and, and really read this whole Matthew 16 and kind of just really grapple with some of these questions Jesus asks. Um, up on the screen you'll see a picture of our uh, all women and team they're heading out uh, this week they leave on uh, uh, they leave this week on Thursday and we're just gonna um, uh, just pray for them as they go and as they leave on or on Saturday leave Saturday right I think it's on Saturday so um, it just be praying for them as they go and, and know that they're part of the living stones that go as part of this they go as a part of you they're not going on their own but we're praying for them as they go and as they travel, working with women and uh, especially uh, orphans in Obaga and widows. And really our goal there is to create a sustaining community. They can eventually be on their own. And so that's one of the things they go to do. So just be praying for them. So would you bow your heads for a closing prayer? Uh, God, we pray that your blessings would wash over this team as they travel, be with them, uh, that they might be your living stones going to be a part of the church community there in Obaga and that they might be a blessing. Uh, wrap your arms around them when they put their seatbelts on, help them remember your Holy Spirit goes with them. Uh, God, thank you for this opportunity today to think about what it means to sacrifice, to deny, and to follow you. It's not easy, but when we do that, we do that because we've said these words, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God, and, and you invite us to go into the world and to live out that faith that God, it starts with our being, and, and it starts with the fact being with you because you're our savior, you have saved. We don't have to do anything to receive that gift of salvation from the cross, and the cross has been transformed just like you long for our souls to be transformed to experience new life and refreshment from you. God, help us to discover our soul as we find you. In the name of your son, Jesus, we ask these things and we pray and the people of God said, amen. Go in peace and serve God. Oh, your grace, so 